like any budding photographer, you know, I was, I, of course, I got National Geographic magazine. That's, that's sort of the standard in photography. And I remember when this issue came in the mail. It's called, it was a story called Storming the Tower. And I, you know, I read the story, and it was about four guys from Wyoming that went to Pakistan, and they climbed this tower called the Nameless Tower. And it was an epic adventure. It was like two months, and they, they kept getting, like the weather was keeping them from completing this objective, and there was like war in Pakistan, and they were having to like argue with the government because their visa was way up, and they just like pounded again. There was all these obstacles against all odds. It was extremely difficult, and they did the route. And I remember reading it and being like, that is a serious adventure. Like that's, like, that's incredible. Well, in Colorado, it wasn't uncommon to see people rock climbing at different places. And, and I had a couple friends that did it. So I called up a buddy of mine, his name was Ty. And I told him about the story that I'd read. And I asked him if he would take me out. And he did. So we went out climbing. And for the next few years, I, I just I fell in love right away. And I got really into it. And this now became this new reason to go on little weekend adventures, right? Find a new climbing area and go, go, go with meeting new people. And it was a new community of people as well. Well, in 2003, September of 2003, I took a, a really bad fall. I fell about 35 feet, but the way I, which is high, but I landed on my side, which is like a terrible place to land, right? And I broke my neck, and I, I broke my pelvic bone. I fractured my kidney and my liver. I, I completely collapsed my right lung, ribs. I spent six days in ICU, and it was a pretty serious accident. And I swore off climbing, right? It didn't take much. <laughs> I was like, that was enough. I was like, OK. And in, my, in, in the defense of rock climbing, I was climbing very recklessly. I was placing gear poorly. And when I fell, it didn't hold, because I was rushing, and I was overconfident. Well, I was freelancing for a magazine outside of my job at Hewlett Packard with a magazine called Wyoming Homes and Living. I had a friend that worked there, and I would get like two or three little assignments from them a year. And about, I don't know, four months after the accident, after I'd kind of healed up, I got a phone call from one of the editors, and they said, we got a perfect story for you. We want you to go to Devil's Tower in Wyoming, and we want you to go climb the tower with this guy, Frank Sanders, and you'll stay at his lodge, and it'll be a travel piece, which you'll get to, we know you like to rock climb, so we thought, we thought of you right away. So I told him what had happened. I said, well, you know, I, I recently had a bad accident, but I wanted the assignment, right? I wanted the job, because I wanted to be a photographer, and, and this was my, these were little vignettes into what it was like to be a photographer. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, can I get Frank's number? Let me just call him, and I'll see what this is all about, like what this job's like. And so I called Frank up, and like a classic Wyoming guy, I told him my story about falling. And he's like, look, man, you had a bad fall. You got to get back on the horse. He's like, you know you made mistakes. You should come up here. This is going to help you. You know, you need to overcome this. And Frank, I didn't realize that he's a legendary rock climber. His fingerprints are all over the planet. Like, he's done first ascents everywhere. And he's really well known for his devil's tower climbing. But I, I didn't know that at the time. So he convinced me to come up. So I did. And, and the, the way it worked was Frank took, me, took three of us up the tower. He led the first pitch, then I would come up behind him, and then I would photograph the, the writer as she came up. And she'd never rock climbed before. He was taking us up the easiest climb on the tower. And she didn't have the right climbing equipment. She had like a bicycle helmet on, so it looked kind of weird. And then when Frank would go up, I was like shooting him, and it was like butt shots, you know? And th so the pictures weren't really that great, but I saw the potential. Because I hadn't looked at climbing really through my camera up to that point. So when I got home, I called up a friend of mine. I called my friend Brian. He was the best climber I knew. And I said, man, I want to go out and shoot some climbing photos. And I, and I had an idea of what I wanted to shoot. I said, there's this bridge just outside of town, and somebody's bolted like river rocks to the like, actual rocks to the bottom of this bridge, and he knew exactly what I was talking about. And so we went down, and we, we took a photo of it. Well, he had just gotten sponsored by a shoe company. He was a pretty good climber. And so, of course, I printed him off like a 13 by 19. You know? I was like, here you go, man. And he said, hey, can I send this to the shoe company? And I was like, yeah, go right ahead. And here's another one for you if you're sending that. You know, I just zipped him one off. So he sends it out, and like a week later, I get a phone call. And they said, hey, we just got this picture from Brian, a big picture. And they, and they said, we love it. Can we, can we buy it for an ad? And I was like, yeah, it'd be amazing. And I think they gave me like 300 bucks. I was like, yeah, it's amazing, right? <laughs> so I was like, we got to go out again, you know? And so he also had a, spon he had a watch sponsorship as well. So we went out and we took some pictures and he sent them off to these guys and they bought an ad. But th they actually didn't pay me. They sent me 30 watches this payment. 30 watches. <laughs> yeah. 
I think my dad still has a couple. It was a classic. I just gave them away. Like, what are you gonna do with 30 watches? But it was cool. It was like it printed, you know, and I'd see it in the magazines. I was like, this is this is really cool, and the success rate's amazing. So Brian says to me, he's like, you gotta meet this guy Andy Rather. He's like, this dude's a real rock climber, right? And he really was. He's living out of his truck. He's a classic dirtbag. Like in the climbing industry, they're called dirtbags, right? People that are just like, they're, they're just, they don't care what they have to do for work. They live out of the truck. They climb all the time. And so Andy was one of those guys, and he's amazing. So I went out with Andy, and we shot one day. And you know, and I scanned pictures. I'm sure I gave him a 13 by 19. He sent, he sent the digital scans I had to a magazine, and I got a phone call, and they bought a cover. And I was just blown away. I was like, this is amazing. I can't believe like, this is going really well. Well, about two months after, I mean, so Andy and I stayed in touch. We were really excited about the whole cover thing. And about two months later, he called me and he said, hey, man, I'm going to southwest Utah to this amazing crag. It's a place people have kind of forgotten about. It's called the Cathedral. And it's this gigantic amphitheater. You got to take a week off work. Come down. We'll shoot photos. It'll be a lot of fun. So I was like, I'm in. So I showed up. And you see, this is big, gigantic arch. And up to this point, the climbing photos I was shooting, they, I wasn't on a rope. I was finding places I could hike up to in little clever ways, like leaning over rock, whatever I had to do. So I was still kind of traumatized from the accident. So I show up, and there's this rope hanging down the center of the amphitheater. And he's like, yeah, man, here it is. And I hung that rope for you. And I was just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, I've got these little rope ascenders. I'll show you how to use them. You can climb up, you know, you can go up the rope. And you'll be right where the action is. Well, I'd come this far, you know, it was like a 10 hour drive and I wanted the photos, right? And it did look incredible. And I knew you got to be where the shots are, right? And so I just sort of like sacked up and went up and got in position and he was right. It's right where he needed to be. And it was incredible watching Andy, just such an amazing, I mean, look at these holds on this steep climbing. And, and so for the better part, like for seven days, we shot pictures, and I just bought my first digital camera at that point. So at the end of the day, we were downloading him and looking at him and getting excited. And so this picture here on the left, it's actually the same move on the right. We shot this picture on the left one day, and that night we're looking at it, and he's like, what if you went higher? And we started formulating plans, and it was, I was like, wow, this is kind of the power of digital and seeing things right away. And so we went, and we had this fantastic week shooting at this really, really incredible place. So at the end of it, I left Andy with a bunch of low-res files, and he sent them out to his sponsors and to magazines and I got another cover story and I sold an ad and I was just like this is amazing and so through Andy I started meeting other people and I, this domino effect happened this was all in 2004 and throughout the, the rest of 2004 I started meeting new people because Colorado's full of rock climbers and I started getting into this really fun community and I started meeting people and they had sponsors they were really good and I started submitting pictures and things started getting published and the, and they're just so there's so many great characters and this is my friend Chuck I met Chuck we went in and shot and they had connections at these magazines I was starting to get them but they were kind of like slightly known entities and throughout that whole year just going out and shooting and sending stuff in it was great so at the end of the year it was actually around November of 2004. I get a phone call from my boss, and he said, you know, we're all getting laid off, basically, the entire team. And he explained that we're all going to get a severance package. And it was kind of a hard thing. I remember there was people, you know, they had much more responsibility than me with like families, and it was like a tough phone call. But he mentioned severance package, and I was like, how much? You know? <laughs> and he explained it was like four months pay or something. And if you, if you sign something, they give you a little extra. And I was like, yeah, I'm in. And so they, the cool thing about Hewlett Packard was a great place to work. I really enjoyed it. But all of a sudden, I just had this really great year, and I was having so much fun. I said, this is my opportunity. I'm going to take this money, and I'm going to make it work. Well, I had just bought a house probably five months before, so I had responsibility in my life. And so I looked at the money. It was the first time I looked at money. I was like, this, this is time. And I did the math, and I, I forget, it was maybe like $20,000 or something. And I, was, you know, I just looked at it as a road map. I've got this much time. I've got to pay my bills. And I got in my car, and I was like, I'm going wherever the climbers are. So in the winter time, you know, January 1st was when we, when I got, you know, that was the official date. We got two months notice and then I left. So January 1, pew, I went to Southwest Utah because that's where everybody's going. And I moved in with this guy. Okay. <laughs> this is Joe Haynes. We called him Kentucky Joe. And um, he and his wife, they property managed like an apartment complex. 
And so a lot of climbers would go stay there. This was in Mesquite, Nevada. And it's, it's really slow time of year in Mesquite, Nevada in the wintertime. So they had all these extra rooms and they would just let us stay for free. And it was like free internet, free place to stay. So like all the dirt bags would just like go and <laughs> stay at Kentucky Joe's. And he was as crazy as he looked, right? <laughs> like he would like hunt squirrels and, and he would can stew and he'd bring the stew to the crag and like he was just a crazy person but he was salt of the earth man he had great stories and you either loved him or hated him right he was either a total pariah or he was like I like this guy and I liked him I connected with Joe because he's a little crazy and I knew a lot of crazy people growing up and so with all the dirt bags in one area, it was so much fun, right? We're all more or less unemployed, and uh, I was lucky. I got an assignment pretty quickly, my first assignment. Up to this point, everything I was shooting was on spec, which means I would shoot it, send it in, hope for the best. Well, I got a phone call from Climbing Magazine, and they said, we want to do a profile on Andy Rayther. So this is Andy here. So for like a month, we went out every day, and we shot pictures. And one day, we had like a really bad, like it was like three days of bad weather, actually. And during that time, I said, we should go out and shoot a portrait. Because all the skateboard magazines I grew up reading, there was always like a portrait of the guy. We should try and do that for Climbing Magazine. So we went out to the desert where there's all this like junk and garbage, and we started shooting these like silly portraits, right? We started like coming up with all these different scenarios and like shooting, shooting all these weird things and finding stuff. And, and, it, and, it was, and we were just like laughing, taking these pictures. And these pictures become quite important to me, but I'll get to that in a minute. So we had all this fun shooting them, right? And uh, sent, you know, sent in the ones that worked, and we, and we ran the, the story and everything, and it was great. And I kept meeting new people that were down in the area. And I just started shooting with them and sending pictures in all the time. And for that whole year, 2005, it was like 2004, but this time I was off the leash, and I had these like financial whips kind of cracking behind me because I had this mortgage that I was not even at the house anymore. And I was just like, you know, I had to make it work hustling. And I w it was one of the most fun, carefree years of my life, going around with climbers to places I've never been, crag to crag to crag, stories, camping, so much fun. Best year of my life, maybe. So at the end of 2005, things had gone well. And, I, and I, in my heart of hearts, I was like, I, I just, I got to do whatever I can to make this happen. Keep going. So I had a friend, his name's Dave Black. He's an he's a incredible photographer, kind of a legend. And he, he lived in Colorado Springs. And, and uh, I was lucky enough to befriend Dave in 2005. And he was always someone I could lean on for advice. And he called me at the beginning of 2006. And he said, hey, I just got off the phone with a friend of mine at the New York Times. And he has a story he wants to do in Uray, Colorado. It's about ice climbing. And I recommended you, you know, do you want to do the job? And I was like, man, absolutely. Paid work? Like, yes. And he's like, cool. Well, expect a call, man. The guy's name's Brad Smith. So about an hour later, you know, on my little flip phone, it says, the, the caller ID says, one, 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 one. It's all ones. It was really weird. I was like, this is either a collection agency or it's Brad. And I'm taking it. You know, so I took the call and it's Brad Smith, New York Times. How's it going? I said, hey, how's it going, Brad? And he said, I just got off the phone with Dave and he told me that you were interested in doing this story. I looked at your website and luckily I had a website way back then because that's what I did for Hewlett Packard. So I was a little ahead of the curve. I had a little online portfolio. He said, I looked at your website and I like your work. I see a lot of climbing photos out there. I want to do an ice climbing story. Do you shoot ice climbing? And I was like, yeah, no, of course I shoot ice climbing. No problem. <laughs> of course. And he's like, all right, cool, man. Dave says you're good. And he said, okay, so the story is Uray, Colorado. It's a small mountain town. And it's a mountain town that doesn't have a ski resort. But what they do have is they have this box canyon that winds through the, through the town. And they've got hoses that they've lined along the entire top of it. And they spray water down at night. And it builds up ice formations. And it's the only ice park like it in the planet. And what I'm interested in is that this little ice park brings in about $5 million of additional revenue to the town every winter. So it's a really great economic stimulus. So I think there's a really cool story there. And I'm like, cool. So he sent me a bunch of pictures of, of you know, things he wanted to see. And he said, the week I'm going to send you down, at the very end of it, they do, an, they do like an international climbing competition. So there'll be a lot of people there to take pictures of, but I'm not really interested in the competition. I'm more interested in the economics of this place. But you'll have plenty of people to work with. I'm like, great. I'm on my way. So I went down, and, you know, and, and as soon as I showed up, it was really a special place, and I was kind of blown away. 
So one of the pictures Brad had sent was like, I want you to go down. I want you to shoot straight up. I want to see what it looks like looking out of the canyon. So I get down there. I know how to rappel. I get down. I, like, I have no crampons on, and I'm like slipping around the ice. I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. And I get down to the bottom, and thank God I had a helmet. As I just said, befriended some stranger who was getting ready to go down, and I asked him if I could shoot his photo. And as soon as he starts rappelling down on top of me, he knocks like all this ice down. I get hit in the neck and I'm just like, oh my God, this is definitely not like rock climbing. And I'm slipping around. I don't know what I'm doing. And so I take the pictures and at the end of the day, I had to transmit all my pictures to Brad. And I'd never worked for a newspaper in my life, right? And at the end of the day, I have to send in my selects and then he's going to call and give me feedback. So at the end of the day, one, 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 Brad Smith. Hey, man, love the pictures. This worked. Tomorrow, I want, I want to see what people, how they commute. How do they get through the ice parks? I'd go, spend the day, clack, 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 shooting the way people kind of move around, walking across ladders, send the pictures in, get a phone call that night, get my marching orders for the next day. All right, I want you to shoot details. It's kind of a barbaric sport. I want to see what it looks like when they kick the ice and hit the ice with the axe. No problem. Super engaged editor. I'd never had an experience like this. And so I'm going and getting them the shots, get the phone call that night, all the ones, get my marching orders for the next day. And so this is the final day. This is on Friday. So I go out and he says, I want big landscape shots of climbers. I just want to see them alone on these blue curtains of ice. So I go out and the whole day, that's what I focus on. So I transmit my pictures, and then that night, it's the last day of the shoot, he calls me up. Ones come in. What's up, Brad? At this point, we're like pretty good friends. And then he says, hey, man, just got the shots. Really happy with the photos. You did a really good job this week, and I got some good news. So we're gonna, my, my editor said we can run a full color s section in this, you know, the whole sports section. We're going to give you two pages of color. He's like, which is big deal. We don't do a lot of color in the paper. I'm like, cool. And he said, and I've got even better news. We're going to run one of the pictures on the front page. And I didn't really realize the gravity of this. I was like, that's great, man. Yeah, I'm so glad you like the photos. And I'd love to do another job with you. Because I'm like, I need to work, man. And, <laughs> and, he's like, and he's like, he's like, yeah, yeah, no, totally. It was such a good job. And, uh, and yeah, you know, congratulations, man, front page. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited, man. That's great. And I got all kinds of ideas. So like, I don't know, I can just email them to you. And so for the third time, he's like, he's like yeah, Keith, you get in the front page, man. And so now I'm like, well, he's kind of making a big deal about this. Like, I should show some gratitude. And I was like, yeah, I'm just, man, I'm so honored. You know, that's fantastic. And he's laughing on the other end of the line, right? This is like New Yorker guy. And he's clearly like, look at this like, greenhorn. This guy doesn't know what he's doing. And so he says to me, he says, he says Keith, do you know what the, the circulation of the New York Times is internationally? And I said, man, Brad, I'll be honest. You know, I, I've seen it in Starbucks and Barnes and Noble. <laughs> And, I, and I'm sure you can get it anywhere in New York, but I have no idea. And he's laughing. I'm sure I'm on speakerphone at this point. And he's laughing, and he tells me the number. And I, it was huge. It was 50 million. It was gigantic internationally. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's crazy. And so he's laughing. And he says, man, great job. You should go get a drink on me. You know, it bill me for it. And he's all, and also, I want you to stay on tomorrow and give me an extra day. I'm like, fantastic. So I go over, and I, I, this is the first time I got to hire an assistant. I brought like a friend of mine. So I ran over to my friend and I told him the good news. Of course, pretending like I knew that that was a big deal. I'm like, front page, man. And so, so we went, we had a drink, and the next day we went out and we shot like the pickup day. And I remember walking into the park and people had the New York Times and were looking at it and talking about it. Like, oh, you Ray, this isn't here. Who is this dude who shot it? You know? Because <laughs> I didn't tell, who am I going to tell? Like, I didn't even know. It was, it was like, New York Times, this is some newspaper job. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, and I'm thinking, like, wow, they even get it here, like New York Times, too. <laughs> so, so we finished up the shoot and it was amazing, right? So, like, a week later, I get a phone call from this agency in Breckenridge, Colorado. And they said, hi, uh, Keith, we, we saw your photos in the New York Times. We really loved them. They said, do you shoot snowboarding? And I was like, yeah, of course I shoot snowboarding. Like, what, what do you need? And they said, well, we're doing an advertorial, which is a word I'd never heard of. And they said, we're going to have the art director call you. We'll call, she'll call you in an hour. And I was like, great. So I get a phone call in an hour. It's from this girl, Leslie. And she says, hey, um, really excited to work with you. I, I, I love your, you know, I looked at your website. I saw the pictures that you shot for the New York Times. And she said, the story we're doing, she's like, it's an advertorial, which means that we're getting a bunch of products from different companies. And we're going to go out and we're going to shoot kind of like a 
people getting ready to go snowboarding and they're going to be carrying all this equipment with them and walking around with it and it's going to run in numerous magazines kind of like an ad but it reads like a story and I was like great and she's like do you have any portrait work and all I had was like the crazy portraits of like the guys throwing the bike and the, the fake weights and all that other stuff and I was like yeah I do she's like just send it over I just want to see it and I was like so I emailed her that's so all I had so she calls back in like 20 minutes and she's just dying laughing, right? She's, she's just like, I can't believe you sent that. You know, she's, she said it in a way like I was kind of holding back on like my really good portraits. And I, as, a, as a laugh, I sent her that. And I was like, but I got the job, you know? And so we went out and for like, for three days, we just shot people like getting ready to go have fun. And we never went and had fun. We just basically shot, shot all the, and it was all new to me. And we went and we did this, this story and it turned out great. And it was a new connection, and all of a sudden I had this new client that was also local, which was great. So about two weeks later, I get a phone call from this company in Canada, and they said, hey, we saw your New York Times story. And I'm like, ah, Canada. You know? <laughs> and, so, and they said, we, we, we've got a catalog coming up. We know you shoot rock climbing, and we've got, a, it's, we've got to shoot a lot of clothing as well. You know, do you shoot catalogs? And of course, I'm like, of course I shoot catalogs. Like, yeah. <laughs> Like, you know, and they asked me what my rate was. I, I didn't know what that meant, you know. And I, but I'd read somewhere that if someone asks what your rate is, you always ask, like, what's your budget? You know, you, put, you, you basically just, like, deflect the question. So I ne poorly negotiated some kind of rate. And I drove down to Las Vegas, and we, we shot this catalog. And again, I found myself taking pictures of people getting ready to go have fun, you know. But we never really got to have the fun. But it was a whole new experience. So a couple of months after that, my friend Chuck Freiberger, who I talked about earlier, he was a budding filmmaker, and he called me up and he said, hey man, I'm, I'm going to South Africa this, this summer, and I want to make a film. I'm going to go for 10 weeks, and uh, I want you to come along as a photographer. And I've already talked to a couple magazines, I've got a bunch of sponsors on board, people want photos, and um, you want to come. And I was like, oh my God, of course I want to come. Yeah, I don't have to drive there for one, which is amazing. So that's all I'm doing these days. And uh, I've never been to South Africa. So May comes along, we packed, like ev I packed everything I had. I was still shooting film cameras as well as the digital cameras, overloaded the car, and off we went to South Africa. And one of the first things we did was, as we were, you know, where we were staying, we, we kept seeing advertisements for this, like, safari that was in the area. We're like, we're in Africa, man. We have to go on safari. So we drove down. I think it was called, like, the Boschenbach Safari Camp. And so we went down, and it was really hacky. It felt kind of weird. There was, like, fences everywhere. And it looked more like acreage, and there was animals roaming around. And we went in into the entrance, and we, we paid, like, our $10 or whatever. And the first thing the guy says to us, he's like, hey, you know what? I have a young lion that if you guys, because we were telling him how excited we were to be there. He's like, if you want to go into the pen, you can pet her. <laughs> and I'm the first guy. I'm like, let's, for sure, we want to do that. Like, yes. Yeah. Oh, wait, let me go back, because this video just plays. And so this is the video of what happened. Daniel, I'm so scared right now. Dude, Keith just got clawed at. <laughs> Dude, it's like a big kitty cat <laughs> that has claws that will kill you. You take half a step left. Well, never mind. Just like a full. Hey, bud. Right. Right. Oh my god. Come on, get it. <laughs> I saw that one coming. That's cool. Did you get that, Chuck? Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, this is the shot right before the, the animal jumped on me. But the, the worst part about it is all my friends just laughing, right? <laughs> like a lion just jumped on me. And I was laughing too. If, if you li really listen to the clip, that's my reaction to death was like laughter, right? But so, anyway. The trip started, right? And it was, it was the most fun 10 weeks. Oh, so fun. Carefree, a motivated group. Every day, someone was out doing some really cool rock climb, and I got to just go along and take pictures. And it didn't matter what time of day. There's a full moon tomorrow night. We should go out. It was just motivation, motivation. To my friend Andy Ray, there was all the people I'd been hanging out with for like the, the previous year and a half. And, uh, and it was just so much fun. And I got to shoot landscapes every morning. I would get up early. And South Africa, to this day, it's probably my favorite country. I absolutely love it. It's an incredible place. And I fell in love with bird photography. There's amazing animals down there. And uh, even the animals like try to like break into your car and stuff. It's a crazy place, right? 
And at the end of the trip, we actually did this great white shark breaching trip. And uh, th this shark right here, it's actually, you can see there's a little fishing line here. They, they would float like a decoy seal behind the boat early in the morning. And then once the sharks kind of wake up, it's really basically, basically dependent on seals. There's, a, there's an island called Seal Island. There's like 30,000 seals. And once the sun comes up, they go up to the sea to basically eat. And we saw like s this happen six times with real, real seals. This right here is just the decoy seal. It was an amazing experience. Like, Africa is so cool. So it was a trip that left a real impression in my life. And I, I started thinking like, I want to do big expeditions. I want to see more of the world. Like there's just so much out there to see. About four years ago, I was having a drink with a friend of mine, Lucas Gilman. And he said this while we were t talking. He said, man, friendships with athletes is it's the red carpet to seeing the world. And it's really true. And I would, I would even extend that and just say your friendships in general, even with the people you work with, the magazine side and the advertising side, all of it. These friendships, they, bec they become your best friends, right? And especially with the athletes that you're traveling with. Because, you know, who better to travel the world with than the people you love the most? Because things happen, right? Getting lost in a country you've never been in before and, uh, you know, climbing a big mountain and, and going on a cool expedition with cool people. You know, these are experiences you want to do with people you love. Because it's, it's such a fun life of exploration and it's, it's all made only better with people that are equally passionate about doing it as well. And so as the years rolled on, I continued to work heavily like in the editorial world with the different climbing magazines and go see different places and it was so much fun. And the goofy portraits I started out shooting on early on turned into a column for, for Rock and Ice magazine, which is my fav favorite climbing magazine. And for four years, I, I shot just illustrated portraits of the different you know, colorful people in the climbing community and got to meet so many fun people and hear their stories. And in 2010, Something happened in photography that really changed things. And it was all of a sudden you could do video in your, in your still camera. And it sent ripples through the photography community in a lot of ways because there was, in a lot of ways, nervousness because there were people writing like on online blogs and different places that like video is going to replace photography. In the future, it'll just be directors and people will pull still frames when they need photos. And I'm reading all this like, wow, this is crazy. I need to like learn how to shoot video. And it was all like, it was all nonsense because they're two completely different things, which I'll, I'll, I'll show here in just a second. But I completely jumped on the bandwagon and I quickly fell in love. Shooting video is a lot of fun. It's a new way to tell a story. And it's a completely different creative process. And that's the one thing I found out within probably the first like couple months of playing with it. When you're shooting a photo, a photo is about like an isolated moment, something that when, when things come together, something that's interesting. Like we've all seen pictures where like somebody's eyes are, they blunk, they're blinking their eyes or something or they're making a stupid face and you're just like, it's a bad photo. But if someone looks good, you're like, oh, that's a fine photo, right? It's the same in video. You want to capture a sequence of events. In photography, you want to capture a moment, right, of action. So this picture here, this isn't the best surfing photo, but it's at least interesting to look at, right? You got this guy, he's grabbing his surfboard, he's kind of making this carve move. So when I shot this photo, I was also rolling video on a tripod next to me. Now watch the video clip. It's pretty uneventful, right? The waves, are, the waves aren't that good. Basically what this guy was doing, he was, we were doing this ad shoot and he was getting towed in and he was doing like tricks off of these waves. Like he's, he was meant to just like blast and do tricks. Well, he came in a little late, so he just kind of carved out of it. But I shot a photo at the same time because I'm just rolling on like a locked off video tripod. So when you see it coupled with the photo, again, the video clip is nothing, but there's still like a little moment in there. And that's what photography is all about, right? It's finding that moment. And video is all about finding a sequence that makes sense, a clip that you can cut to and tell a better narrative story with later. So it was good, there's these good lessons to learn early on. When I got really into video, it became the new editorial. You know, instead of going out and shooting a, a story for a climbing magazine, it was like, let's go make a film. And it slowly learned, it sort of turned into doing like bigger expeditions. 